90 degree turns where we expand the minds, beliefs, and perspectives of the collective and awaken the sleeping many from their slumber. I'm your host, Trisha, and today we have the pleasure of speaking with remote viewer John Vivanco. Welcome, John, to our show. Thanks. <laughs> um, so, I you guess... just took a. I'm going to interview you first. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Let's, let's flip it around. <laughs> so, I just taught a remote viewing class, and you took the whole thing. Yeah. So, what do you think? I mean, is I it... thought it was amazing. Okay. It was it was different than what I expected because I came into it not knowing what remote viewing was at all, um, and I thought that it would be more I get like a sense of knowing and intuitiveness to it, but as I took it, you kind of just have to trust what comes through, and every time we did a an, a, like a little e experiment, right, it turned out that whatever I was trusting that was coming through was right, and it was incredible. The things we looked at, yeah. I mean, we tried to find Genghis Khan's tomb. Right. You know, we looked at sky serpents. Right. Like someone doing Qi Gong or, yeah. or Tai Chi. And yeah. it was really cool. I mean, even went off planet with certain groups. Yeah. Um, so and the collective image streaming, you know, it was amazing. So I, remote viewing, when you took remote viewing, it, so it wasn't what you thought it was going to be? Well, I didn't know what to expect coming into it. I yeah. didn't have any kind of preconception of this is what it's like. Right. I just took it literally as I will be reviewing re reviewing something remotely. Right. I you see. Know? Okay. That that's really I'm like okay this is all I know about it and yeah. I'll go into it. I yeah. didn't know that it was like a CIA project earlier right, and exactly. that they were black ops probably still doing it. You know. And yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Right. I came into completely blind. Right. Okay. Which I think personally for me it helped. Yeah. Because um, I didn't have any expectations to it so whenever you told us to do something like just let things flow and right. see what comes to you i had to just trust that right you know and not create a story around it right exactly mm -hmm. that's cool that's a really interesting way to come to a remote viewing class usually yeah. people who come to my classes have researched the history of it the military history and i guess i should talk about what that is yeah um yeah that's the typical student that i get they they know of it, um, they've researched the whole thing, it interests them, and then they do it, as opposed to just like jumping in without knowing that's what they're doing. <laughs> um, so remote viewing comes specifically from the, uh, well, it was in the 1970s, early 70s, late 60s, the, the, there was this um, rumor going around that the Soviets were developing psychic spies. And, um, because of that, so intelligence agencies, if they hear of another intelligence agency doing something that they're not doing, they have to do it just to see if it's a viable way of collecting intelligence. Okay, makes sense. It doesn't matter so much because, um, you know, people in power have been using like psychic information for a long, long time. I mean, all the way back to uh, ancient Greece, you know, the Oracle of Delphi and stuff like that. So anyway, they set up a program. Actually, they needed to investigate first. They, ha they got with a company or a, a institute named uh, SRI, so Stanford Research Institute. Um, they hired a couple of guys to investigate uh, if remote viewing can be, if, if psychic information can be used in a repeatable manner. Mm -hmm. And if it could be used in a repeatable manner, then How they had to set up a program to counter what the Soviets were doing. So Russell Targ, Hal Prudhoff, those guys, they were accomplished laser scientists working for SRI out of Menlo Park uh, in San Francisco. They moved the program to figure it out. So they brought in natural psychics, one guy named Ingo Swan, who it was he was their test subject. but. In this case, the test subject turned into the guy that was actually developing the program to a large degree. He had really huge insights into the direction it should go. Not that Russell Targ and Hal Prudhoff didn't as well. They all worked it together instead of, we're just going to test it on psychics all the time. Um, so what happened was they eventually developed this into what we call a methodology or a protocol, remote viewing protocol. And the way it works is that the primary thing is to keep the psychic blind. In other words, they don't know what they're going to be looking at beforehand, so they can't make things up. And the way they do that is 
they assign, they create just a random eight digit number and then they write down what they want that remote viewer to remote view, right? Or psychic to look at. And it, it basically goes something like, if I wanted you to remote view the Eiffel Tower current time, I would write that down and then put a random eight digit number with it. Then I'd give you that number and there you go. You would mm -hmm. just follow the protocol and if see what, end, we get. <laughs> see what you get. At the end of the session, then um, you would, uh, we would analyze it up against the other sessions that the other viewers did and, you know, find the corroborative points and build a report around it. And that's basically how it works. Um, that's a good point you bring up is that it's, you can do it individually, but it probably is way more effective if you have, let's say, five, ten people working yeah. on a single eight digit code together. It's way, right? Because everyone gets a piece of the puzzle. Yeah, exactly. Everyone gets a piece of the puzzle and then you have corroborative points and points line up. So it just makes it extremely accurate. And then think about, you know, how cheap of an intelligence gathering tool this is. You don't mm -hmm. have to send anybody anywhere. Um, you just have people sitting at a desk just writing stuff. It's cheap, super cheap. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not dangerous. Well, mm, are, mm, well we could go it's, into that a little later. There's psychically cautious. Dangerous. Right. You got to be cautious sometimes. Yeah. Um, so you said that... Uh, you mentioned the example of having the Eiffel Tower in present time. Right. So when we were, when I was in your course, we kind of hopped around all different places, it right. seemed. And so remote viewing, from my understanding, is independent of space, time, the entire linear concept of that we are used to in this 3D reality. Right. Yeah. Remote viewing is a fourth dimensional skill. Mm -hmm. So when you talk about dimensions, we have three dimensions to us. When we go into imagination zone, for instance, uh, that is more in the fourth dimensional zone. That's a good mm. uh, metaphor for it so pe that people can understand imagination because you can move and do anything and create things. Mm -hmm. um, that is basically the fourth dimension, but it goes beyond that in that your energy being who you are energetically outside of the physical can move through it and operate within it, can create things within it mm -hmm. um, and have a interesting experiences there. I don't like the fourth dimension so much hanging out there. There's a lot of skullduggery. <laughs> you know, I don't know. There's a lot of weird, weird things, things happening yeah. there. And there's layers to dimensions. Layers Within dimension. dimensions themselves. Right. There's different tiers. Of like the first tier, second, third, fourth. Right. So we've got, uh, you know, people say fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth dimension mm -hmm. beyond, you know. Um, and physicists postulate that there are many dimensions beyond ours. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So but for remote viewing, it's really a skill that um, we use our fourth dimensional aspect to get mm -hmm. information. Um, and, I, you know, this is like the other thing that bugs the heck out of me is the name remote viewing is not correct in my estimation. I mean, it is correct. It's descriptive of what it is, but it's descriptive for the time that they created it, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, I think every era has its... its uh, understanding of how things are and i think yeah. remote viewing the term really fit into that you are an individual who is separate and you're watching a movie play out in your head mm -hmm. but that's not how it works um i feel like you get really in tune with it it's not yeah. like you're just observing like you can feel like emotions come through right you or, notice or that when feel like it. you can put your hands out like and have your eyes closed and you can feel whatever whatever's right. there yeah like, it's I saw really you, trippy like, during yeah i really going, like to like be like kind of just like what what is there you're like and a like, blind person <laughs> yes like, yeah that's kind of how i felt yeah. but i mean as i was doing that i could get certain either sensations like heat right or like buzzing vibrational feelings totally. like it was really trippy right so it was you really know, trippy it's like, like it was, it's not like you're like closing your eyes and you got this mind movie playing you know no no right no i mean there are like when we did the image trim with the group thing that was really cool because we're all sitting there in like a circle, we have the eight digit code, or we already have a place that we decided we want to visit. Let's say like era right. in, the, in the Orion's Belt, I think, right? Yes. Yeah, that, that's a little, a little farther, yeah. far away from here. Um, but we'd sit there in a circle and we'd all collectively start seeing things and we would talk as we're doing it. Right. Which I thought that was really cool because you're kind of like bridging the gap between 3D and 4. Right. You know, because you're consciously, you're, you're streaming things in from 4. Right. But then I'm physically speaking it as it's happening right. in three. Right, you know? exactly. Which to me, I didn't know that I could do that. Right. I didn't know that was didn't possible. Know. I thought either you're in the fourth or higher, you yeah. know, or you're in the 3D. Right. But to mesh it like that and be kind of 
yeah. just intertwining it like it is. It's exactly. And you know, really think, cool. think about this. So you're moving into the fourth dimension. That means other fourth dimensional beings can see you. Yeah. And then if you start looking at something that's in the fifth dimension, that thing can totally see you because yeah. every dimension beyond the next one, they have more awareness of those dimensions that are below them. Mm -hmm. So it, it becomes a situation where you can go and interact with these other beings in those locations. You know, I don't know, people, people, it, it st takes people outside of their third dimensional reality and into something so much more great, so much greater. But back to, you know, what you were talking about in that, you know, feeling and sensations on your body. When you get this type of information, uh, it isn't, sometimes you get the visuals, sometimes you get the sort of scenes playing out, mm -hmm. but a lot of it is sort of this kind of general knowingness and, and sensations throughout your body. Mm -hmm. And um, you can hear things, smell things, it's taste things. It's all the things. senses. It's it all it the completely senses. encompasses all of, all that you are. Right, right. And you have to use all that. And it, you don't really know what's going to come through. Right. Like sometimes I, there, you can visualize things. Or other times I feel it. Other times I'm just, I just have emotions. I'm like, wait, this isn't me though. This, yeah. Yeah, these aren't my emotions coming through. Right. You know? Yeah. So that was really really interesting and then you've and got so it's not it's not really viewing right it's no really it's viewing. being it's being yeah. it's like you're just taking yourself and right placing it somewhere else you yeah. know like like when we saw that what was this like a skydiving par paragliding oh okay Those so crazy the guys, guys the jumping suits. out of the plane yeah yeah base jumping they were base right. jumping out of an airplane and then no they were going mountain. they were going into a moving airplane yeah doorway. but they jumped out of the airplane first right yeah they jumped out of the airplane they're right. flying through the sky and then they end up going the airplane comes by and they pop right, right into it yeah that was the trippiest insane. thing and with that i just kept on feeling like i kept on getting like shivers uh -huh. <laughs> through my body like i was just cold yeah and i kept on thinking of like like snow or right. mountain and i had absolutely no idea what was being chosen right you know you have and no clue i i thought i honestly i thought maybe i was projecting because we're at Iseti here in washington and they so that we have mount adams and there's a lot of uh nature around here and it is kind of chilly now that the yeah. time of the year so i thought maybe i was just feeling i'm feeling cold or i'm thinking of the mountain because i'm here right now yeah. you know but turns out no that was truly what was coming through right, and right. you showed us the video and yeah <laughs> i know yeah. Wasn't expecting that. Not, it's a, not it's at all. It's kind of a visceral experience, you mm -hmm. know, when you really connect. It's, you transport you yourself. It. Yeah, you're yeah. actually there. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about uh, historical events. When you remote view a historical event, you're really there. So, oh, for instance, mm -hmm. I was, okay, this is a while ago. We were at a house, and there were a bunch of remote viewers there, and we were using a monitor. Um, a monitor is somebody that keeps the remote viewer on track and then gives and then asks them questions later on is if they need to. Different than the tasker? Yeah, different than the tasker, person. separate okay. person. Yeah, and so sometimes we work with monitors in, in teams. Mm -hmm. And this, we're in somebody's living room and it was filled with um, uh, remote viewers doing a session. And, and I, was, um, I was doing this session and I, I kept getting this house like on fire with a person in it and stuff on fire. Mm -hmm. And then I would I would jump to this other aspect of a, um, I was in a, a, a aluminum or metal tube and I was looking at maps and stuff like that. And all I did was jump back and forth, back and forth, back and forth the whole session. Finally, at the end of the session, the monitor, by the way, I'm getting, I'm feeling hot, like burn mm -hmm. marks or burns on my body. All, and I keep writing that stuff down. and. Finally, my monitor's like frustrated with me and he says, okay, what I want you to do is go to the house. I want you to go to the door, open it up and go outside. Okay. So I stood up, you know, from the couch, mm -hmm. I closed my eyes and I'm like, okay, I'm going to walk into the door and I grabbed the door and I opened it up. Right when I opened it up, I had what's called a bilocation experience and I started looking around and I started walking and I started running and I was running in place and I was burning. I was literally burning and I was in a city that was all on fire and it was an old city okay. on fire and mm -hmm. I'm running in place in front of this couch and I'm going, I'm yelling, I'm in Dresden, I'm on fire, I'm in Dresden, I'm on fire. So yeah. 
it was the firebombing of Dresden. All the other remote viewers are like, what the hell is wrong no. with this guy? You know, he's going insane. <laughs> he's he's and then deep I, inside of the, right, right. wherever he is, he's in it. <laughs> right. And so, you know, people crowded around afterwards because that was given the disclosure and it was mm -hmm. the Dresden firebombing. Wow. I knew where I was and I had literal burn marks. Afterwards? Like, yes. I had burn marks like on my neck down my arms so and people like are physical like, oh residue my God. from the yes. fourth dimensional physical like residue travel right exactly wow. so this this makes you wonder so i was affected physically i was burned it went away after about 15 minutes and i knew exactly where i was so mm -hmm. what happened so i was there when it, there was a fire bombing yeah. i experienced past history from this point in time like a time travel yeah but what ha what if somebody was there? Would I appear? I mean, I've always had that question. Would I uh, show up like, oh my gosh, what's this thing running down the street on fire? Uh -huh. And then all of a sudden it disappeared. Yeah. You know what I mean? Anyway, yeah, would you just, become part of the story? Would you become, right, the, or the would mysterious you just be, like, Yeah, the mysterious running, stranger who just runs. Yeah, right. He's running and he's and on he's fire. And he's screaming, I'm in Dresden, and no one I'm knows on fire. Who, <laughs> and no one knows who he is at right, all. Right, right. <laughs> I, <laughs> I mean, maybe in some alternate reality, there's like a history book there. Right, that, right, right. That is like, yeah, there's a strange character. He just shows up right. all throughout different points yeah. in history and time. Stay away from this no street. One... It's completely haunted of the guy on yeah. fire. Right? He <laughs> yeah. shows up every like he just starts yelling anniversary where he is. of Dresden. <laughs> yeah. Firebombing, right? I know. Oh. <laughs> oh, that's so trippy. I know. Wow. <laughs> I know. So, so then tell me that if you could go in the past, then you could most likely... Most certainly go into the future. Yeah, right? you can go into the so future. So the, right away when I think of that, it's kind of like the film Back to the Future. Right. When you have like Marty McFly, he, he's in the he's in a specific time right. frame, like in the 80s, and then he goes to the past. But then he can also go in, and it's affecting his future and all that, and it kind of changes all these timelines. Right. So let's say if you want to do something like like horse, horse racing or something, and you want to know what horse is going to win, something really simple that right. seems to not have a lot of rebuttal so you can right? make some cash yeah you could just make some money that's all <laughs> i want to know which horse simple. is going to win this next race right? yeah right. yeah you want to know the kentucky derby what's going to right who's gonna right win? who's going to win well so there are some there are different camp camps of remote viewers that do different things mm. in those situations there's a specific type of remote viewing called associative remote viewing and it's basically a tasking method or in other words it's a way to ask a remote viewer a question on who's gonna win without the remote viewer knowing. And it's basically, might be too complicated for your viewers, I don't know, but it's 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 getting two photographs that are, they look totally different from each other, like a waterfall photograph mm -hmm. and a um, maybe a uh, cityscape photograph. Okay, very like polar, like opposites. Polar opposites. Yes. And the question for the remote viewer is to, <clears throat> you associate one photograph with team A or, or like, yeah, let's just do sports, like Team A, like Seattle Seahawks and New York Giants. Mm -hmm. I think that's both the same sporting. I have I no idea. So. I'm not really into sports. Yeah, but, me either. <laughs> but we can assume that that's, they're two yeah, separate right. teams within the same field of sports. Right. <laughs> so you associate one picture with the Seahawks and one picture with the Giants. It's probably like football and baseball <laughs> that we're mixing up here, but, but you get the image. Right, and the, the, it's the viewer's job to describe the image associated with the team who is going to mm -hmm. win, right? Okay. So, you know, if the Seahawks are going to win, they would describe the waterfall, you know? Okay, so there's that... an association already with whatever right. image was chosen that says, okay, right. Seahawks, Giants, and then they're going to start describing the image, not like the logo of the team. Or... Right, okay. right. So that's okay. associative remote viewing. Interesting. I, I, you know, it... It's probably got a 60, 65 percent success rate, so it's above normal. The prob there's a problem mm -hmm. with it because when you remote view the future, um, so when you remote view the future, things can change. Um, things change normally. There's nothing that's set in stone. But mm -hmm. um, even if you remote viewed it and saw a, a, a set outcome, that outcome will still as we go towards it, we'll, there will still be things that can move and shift. Like alteration. Right. And then when you add a remote viewer into the mix, it creates a more unstable future event because it's kind of like 
the observer in the double slit experiment. This is an experiment mm -hmm. where um, a particle is also a wave. And when they, it's subatomic particles, and when they put an observer in the experiment, it, it, alters. it alters, alters the outcome the, of mm -hmm. the experiment. Mm -hmm. So that's what happens when you put remote viewers on future events. It has okay. the ability to change it. But the closer you get to an event, the more set it becomes. Okay. Right. There's just less time to, for modifications to right, happen. Right, right. So that's with associative remote viewing. What I usually do is I look at the emotional state. Instead, I do this a, a type of tasking where I look at the emotional state of somebody who's attached to something winning. Mm. So I can tell if they're happy. It's super mm -hmm. basic. Or I, and but then I also remote choose. Viewing, it has to be basic. Yeah, it has you know, to be we're basic. not trying to go high level. Right. And and have concepts like you were explaining in the course. Like yeah. You want to go as like basic as you can right. and kind of dig into the, all that basic, that, yeah. the basic information you do receive. Right, right, exactly. Yeah, exactly. So like that presidential election mm -hmm. with, uh, we look at it every four years. I've been doing this for 20 years. I didn't even give my history yet. But anyway, <laughs> I'll give that in a little bit. Um, we look at the, the uh, elections every four years, presidential, and we look at the emotional state of like Trump, for instance, on uh, the moment he realizes the outcome. And then we look at Hillary's emotional state the moment she realizes the outcome. And we clearly see the difference. You know, someone who's like someone either won or someone out, didn't win. Somebody who's super mm -hmm. happy. Mm -hmm. And we knew three months in advance who was gonna win. I knew Trump was gonna win. E even though back then like the polls all said ninety eight percent chance all were Hillary Clinton Hillary. was gonna yeah. win. And yeah. I was yeah. going on the radio saying this, and people, people just thought it was just... insane. Like, yeah. well, whatever. It doesn't what seem very said. probable compared. But the media does like to spin a particular story. They too, basically so... lied. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> they like to spin a lot of stories. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, and the result is it is what it is now. You yeah. Know? It is like what Trump it is. did win. So. Right. Yeah. But what could you maybe go into that? What did you see when uh, you viewed the emotional state of Trump and Hillary? Because I find it to be a very heated topic in general super heated. and even two years later people just go into rage fits of rage right you know you i'm know? not gonna um i'm apolitical yeah i system. i don't stand with either party either i it's just i don't yeah know. but we'll get attacked for that too. i you know you're right you're right <laughs> true but well it, it i think matter. it's, I think it's so interesting though I'm that you look incorrect. at the you look at the emotional states right versus just well i'll tell you okay so let me just tell you what we saw <laughs> i'll tell you so every so every four years we look at the elections and Every four years is pretty much the same thing. You got a winner and a loser. The winner's happy, the loser's sad, but the loser is like, we get, we've get we gotten data in the past that has basically said on the loser side, hey, no big deal, the plan continues. It continues, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. so, so what you see is that the winner and the loser are pretty much connected. They are one and the same thing. That's what I, I estimated from all of our data in the past. Mm -hmm. And it took me to a point where I, I do not get involved with either the Democrat or the Republican because it is a made up story. System. It's a made up mm -hmm. system. It is complete BS to get you to. It's an it's illusion of choice. Sports, that's, all, that's all it is. Yeah. It's, it, it's, yeah, it. it's sports, it's but sports. for politics. Right, exactly. It's an illusion. So this last election, the data that we got was different than the past data, which, mm -hmm. which makes me watch what's happening now with interest mm -hmm. to see really what's going on. So the data we got was that, um, you know, Trump is happy, very, very happy. He's like in candy land and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's the descriptive stuff we were getting um, in the data. And then Hillary Clinton, she was freaked out, ballistically freaked out. Like some of the viewers even had her like grabbing bars like she's behind bars. So when I saw that dad, I thought, wait a second. That's pretty extreme compared to just feeling happy, right. sad. Right, exactly. You know, exactly. wow. Exactly. So wow. my estimation at this point, I mean, it actually is pretty clear. Trump is outside of their system. He's outside of the circle. That He's outside of their circle. Mm -hmm. Exactly. He's and some havoc. <laughs> I truly think something's coming down yeah. on, on that side. Yeah. Um, I mean, I feel like so just I watch this with interest. couple years alone, you could see all the different... He's just ch she's shaking yeah. their whole foundation right. that is that's been built. Absolutely. You know, he's absolutely shaking it up, and right. I mean, he's trying to do, in my opinion, what JFK tried to do and warn the right. people about things that were undercover and yeah. top secret. You know, right. but this time he has an alliance. Yeah, 
so he's not dead yet. Yeah. You know, which right. is which is pretty uh, cool. Yeah. You know, I mean, things can actually there's going to be some. I mean, there's already been a lot of changes. Right. Just this year, you know. Right. But well, if you look at all the sealed indictments, you've got mm-hmm. 50, over fifty thousand sealed indictments. When in a normal year, I think it's like a thousand yeah. sealed indictments. So that means that things are moving. Yeah. It's <laughs> They're weird. moving. It's interesting. You know? Yeah. It's very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe we can get off the whole political side right, of things. I, know. So, I mean, but it is good to mention because yeah, there's everything is intertwined and. It all unfold the way it's supposed to be, right. but it is interesting to talk about, especially with a remote viewing perspective. Right. It's an entirely different viewpoint, yeah. you know? Um, so we're here at the Yuseti Ranch in Washington at the Galactic Medicine Wheel. Um, so this is a, an area on the land where you can kind of connect to your star families. So we, there's a Sirius. This is one of the, one of the uh, I guess, ga- galaxies? Or this is a uh, star system. It's a, it's a star system. Star and so you can, um, if you sometimes feel pulled towards the serious beings, you can, you'll feel it when you're here. They have all the different, I think there's five or six. So you have Sirius, Pleiadians, um, Arcturians, Arcturians, Andromedaeans, and oh, the Orion beings. I think those are the main ones. Yeah. And then there's other ones like Elementals or Bigfoot right. or Ascended Masters. But it's really interesting because you can kind of do this meditational kind of walk and connect to your different star families and it's really obvious when you do yeah <laughs> you can just feel this visceral like pull right to it yeah. this is this i i can feel i think anybody if they came here could feel the vibe the energy mm-hmm. especially with this one i don't know why it's the lion beam it's the lion <laughs> yeah because it's part of this whole part of the whole thing mm-hmm. it's Collective very energy. interesting yeah. i really feel it i get all tingly yeah yeah, just sitting here, it's really nice. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the land itself is very energetically pulling. Yeah. Um, I And I hear James talk that it's like a vortex. Right. Of sorts. And so there's a lot of different interesting activity that happens in the sky. Right. And with when people, when they come here. Yeah. I mean, you either get pulled, I feel like, towards this place, pushed away, or you come here blind and you maybe some things will come up. Right. You'll work through. It's a place to work through things, yeah. I think. Definitely, whatever blockages you may have the energy here will just push into the surface yeah i've you know? noticed that um it amplifies it it amplifies positive feeling and it amplifies negative feeling mm-hmm. and it's like both of those you have to um, allow yourself to feel and not go react with against things like mm-hmm. it, it can like make your ego go insane or it can make you feel just a lot of shame yeah. And so, mm-hmm. and so, you have to just allow yourself to feel it in order to move through it. Well, that's until part it of any of the blockages, right? Yeah, like it'll, those are the it'll come up. Right. And whatever it is that you're feeling, you have to let it just let right. it come up. Let right. it, you have to go through all you of have to it. Go through it. And that's not pleasant all the time. Not always pleasant, right. you know. If it's more negatively, yeah, on that side. But um, you let it go through, and then things end up being all right. You know. I, I know. I this feel like this. This is a place where you can really. It goes makes your karma go fast in yeah. a sense, you know, it like speeds up your karma. Yeah. This definitely. place is so amazing. I mean, literally, it's like, okay, so over there there's a vortex. I've captured photographs of like winged discs and UFOs right in that area, right there. Really? Coming out of the vortex. James Wait, in the field? Like in the on, field. In really. So yeah. not in the air. It's like in the field. Right, right in, in the here. Field. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Um James has seen what he called a dragon fly into the ground right there. Serious? Other people have wow. seen things come and go from there. Right there is where a ship, we remote viewed this. There was a, um, a light coming in across the sky and the sky took it in 2009. Mm-hmm. And um, it was hovering in the sky over the field and it started blinking down and appearing in the field. And it was, wow. a, it was doing it right there right in that general right area. right across from where we're sitting yeah That's right across from where we're sitting wow. um and then over there you've got this whole pleiadian yeah the pleiadian uh, circle it's... that's super vibey but it's a different feeling it's a different energy all these mm-hmm. have different energies to you you can really feel what they them. do I, I mean to me i can really feel it when i'm like at sirius or orion it's just different kind of pulls right. and then pleiadian circle is really pleasant that's my favorite it's, actually it's just i feel like it's a nice it's happy new it's just a pleasant place yeah. you know like i didn't know about the vortex that's right across from us here but then we have mount adams to yeah. our left which has a lot of wild activity so 
yeah. a couple of days ago we were seeing the mountain um there were these flashings going on and they're definitely not hikers because it's in the middle of the night and it's too bright i think it's like 13 miles away the, the lights the headlamps that the hikers would have had had would be like a car headlight or something flashing yeah. their brights right. if that it, it would have to be Massive super spotlight. intense yeah like a spotlight yeah so there's been some really unique activity uh going on the mountain like i've heard that there's like a door that ships just like kind of like a garage door just opens right. whoop, and then they fly right. out yeah. do their thing um can you tell us about any have you tried remote viewing uh the mountain here and maybe what yeah. what have you what have you found we um so we, we follow normal remote viewing protocol where mm -hmm. the remote viewers are blind, so they can't make anything up and they just go through the process of remote viewing. Then we get all the data and then corroborate the points and build a report on it. So mm -hmm. with regard to the lights, so we would take a video of lights flashing on the mountain and then the basic tasking for the remote viewers is, is basically sh tell me or describe what's causing the lights. How okay. the, how the lights form. So it's a really basic tasking, simple, um, weird stuff. So when you get the data back, I mean, you expect to see, you know, um, like tents and camping and, you know, people hiking and tired and this and that, but we never, ever get any of that. None of that. What we get when we task on that are these sentient, like biological lights right they're mm -hmm. sentient okay. they have a consciousness to them they are biological and believe it or not the viewers describe these cat-like humanoids i mean they're sketching feel like cat I mean. faces with whiskers mm -hmm. and these cat things connect with the um the ball of light and they fly around in them so Wow. So that was the initial stuff that we got on these lights. And then we tasked it again later because you want to see, you know, you know, is it going to be the same every time? Mm -hmm. Or are you going to eventually get campers, you know, you know, with <laughs> rationalize headlamps. It out, right, yeah. rationalize it out. <laughs> and again, you know, tasking it again, it was the same stuff, except this time the viewers were detailing out the, um, the lights a little bit more that are appearing mm -hmm. on the mountain. And they started to draw the lights in moving in this like star shape pattern. Like a Merkaba maybe? Like a Merkaba. Yeah, yeah, that was the thing is that I like a three D like Merkaba. it's three D mm -hmm. Merkaba, mm -hmm. right? And so when I saw this data, I was so confused by it and I asked James and and that's what he said. It's a Merkaba. And yeah. so I started re researching the Merkaba because I don't know a lot about it. I mean when we look at UFO events, it's usually more on the nuts and bolts side and you've got, you know, big bug-eyed aliens that are collecting genetic material and and taking it somewhere and reproducing it or, or using it to survive to some degree but here it's totally different you know you've got these cat-like humanoids who are creating this what they what they do is they create this merkaba which is considered a um a vehicle yeah a it vehicle translates to, to like light body vehicle light body vehicle like it, it quite literally translates yeah. to that so know? they're building these things they're going and they're like flying around they're, they're flying like around vehicles. yeah sweet <laughs> yeah i mean that is what we get whenever we view that stuff and that's just outside of my zone of experience on mm -hmm. you know remote viewing ufo stuff so over here so the viewers also describe this as they call them vimanas Okay. Right. They, what is that? Vimana is the uh, Hindu term for a flying craft. Oh, okay. So that's okay. really old. It's I think it's in the Vedas, the Vedic mm -hmm. scriptures. Vimanas, the flying ships. They call them that. They call them chariots. I have photographs of like a winged disc, which is from. Okay. I mean, a winged disc is uh, something that people describe seeing uh, in ancient ancient times, in 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 combination with chariots flying through the sky okay you know yeah. so we're getting I mean, stuff it's been written through history that there's things right flying constantly yeah exactly. we're never we've never really been alone right <laughs> ever right you know we're so, part of them they're part of us it's right giant totally. collective totally yeah so these things here so when you're sitting here at you said and you're watching the mountain you see these things light up and they're sustained and they're like mm -hmm. those are merkabas forming 
Those are Merkabas. That's incredible. I know, isn't it I wild? I got some think? footage a couple days ago. Did you? you yeah, got it? I'm gonna I'm gonna send put a link down here, okay. upload it to the channel for sure. Cause yeah. it's not a long video, but it was there was flashing, and then there was two. There was one more in towards the like the bottom quarter right. of the mountain, and then to this like two thirds up. Right. It has another one, and they they look like it's almost like beacons of light signaling to each other. Yeah. Oh, it was really really interesting. You know, undoubtedly some of them are probably hikers. You know, when you see the dim flashes of light, but the mm -hmm. big ones. No. But these were big. These were yeah, very the big very ones, no. clear. They were like, big. They can be hikers. I saw there. what you were filming. The, yeah. Those were the Merkabas. They were really really big, and they were just constant. Like yeah. it was really. Yeah. something else and sometimes they changed colors too yeah i've only before i've been here a couple times i've only seen them white right and then other times the past like week i was here there's some of them were a little bit like red yeah tinted. yeah i didn't know they could i, I didn't i never it's saw amazing. the color change before i know it's just know. it's mind-blowing and really really awesome yeah um could you maybe go into uh the how do you stay safe when you do remote view other beings places events how do you stay safe because this all sounds really cool and really great but i'm sure you wouldn't want to just pop up into the sky right now and say oh i i can see a ship right. let's let's go there you know probably not the wisest decision because you don't know what you're popping into yeah i mean um, do you have any like suggestions for how to just generally your own internal cautious? discernment really i mean if you're if you're engaging something in a, what we call front loaded, in other words, you know what it is you're going to re be viewing beforehand. Mm -hmm. You just want to ask yourself, is this some type of being or is there a being here that that feels good to me that I would like to connect with? Or is it does it feel negative or bad? Mm -hmm. And then if you are use, you have to use discernment. People have to learn that if you're being tasked and it's blind, you know, you don't mm -hmm. know what you're viewing beforehand. You have to trust the person that's tasking you. Like You have to trust that that person is not going to send you into a very negative entity zone you mm -hmm. know some people don't know that and they will just send viewers into it and so if that does happen and you are um starting to feel the negativity within the session then just, you just quit and then ask your ask just your, drop the pen yeah just thing. drop Let the pen go. and Let like it. yeah i'm not going to connect to this because I mean, they might not always know where you're what kind of energies around right. a certain place right it's right. just let's say you're doing a completely unknown right. a new location you've never looked at before right, right? exactly um have you ever had experiences where you go view uh a being or something and they come back yeah there's that happens so some beings will yeah they will follow you back um and hopefully they're good ones mm -hmm. you know and i've had i've had that happen a couple of times one of the most interesting times was when um we were, so we were working with a TV program called Beyond Boundaries, and they were on, I think, the Learning Channel. They, what they would do is go to remote locations where there was some kind of, like, paranormal activity happening, the UFOs or cryptid stuff, and then investigate it. Mm -hmm. they, they were going to Puerto Rico um, to see if they could capture a chupacabra on film. So they asked us if we would remote view where they could find the chupacabra. Mm -hmm. But then the other side of this was that they wanted to know where uh, we could. OK, there were these lights fl like going crazy in the sky in the certain area of Puerto Rico. And the lights were going into the forest constantly. Okay. And the, the locals were seeing it. And they were reporting on it. And they wanted to know what those lights were, the nature of those lights. Mm -hmm. So we did the chupacabra thing and then we jumped over to the lights and I was the first viewer in on the lights, you okay. know, what they were. And I started getting these alien beings. They were very, um, had a very acerbic intelligence to them and they were coming in fast and they were looking for something. Um, they were in these sort of almost like physically they were in these cocoon like pods, but they were also, not physical at the same time. Very, mm. So when you get into remote viewing, a lot of stuff that's outside of 3D reality, it's hard to describe, hard to explain, but that's what it felt like to me during the session. But one time during the session, I got the distinct sensation that they, well, they knew I was there. They knew I was viewing them and they were like, oh, hone, like zeroing in on me. And so I pulled out of the session. Mm -hmm. That and must have I, been a little freaky. Yeah, it was a little freaky. I mean, because you're there to see them, but then they right, look they at like, you and like, wait, who are you? Who are you? What are you doing here? <laughs> right. So then probably two weeks, I don't know how long it was, two weeks later maybe, mm -hmm. I was asleep and I was having this crazy dream. 
and I had felt really tired, like like before, um, like at, right after dinner, and it was weird. I didn't. I've never felt that way, and so I just I just went to sleep, and it was probably within a half an hour to an hour after falling asleep, I started. I was having a crazy dream that they were giving me because they were showing up at the dream or not they were showing up at the dream there was this later on i realized it was them showing up in the dream but they they were showing me this sort of like big craft flying through the sky as i was like trapped in space and oh wow anyway i felt this tapping on my shoulder physically while mm -hmm. i was sleeping and so you know i'm like uh you know <laughs> leave me alone I, whatever I it wanted could to go be back to the dream. Just, yeah and so eventually i just grabbed the hand and it, it, it physically yeah i grabbed you it. felt some so physical tapping and when you grabbed it you felt the physical yeah yeah just to, oh just, my goodness i grabbed wow. the hand and it was like this it was a slick and kind of bumpy surface that pulled away from me and okay. i i jumped up yeah and i sort that's of that's not your dog or anything there, no, right? no, like, no 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 <laughs> and i moved back i just like moved because my bed was up against the wall in the corner mm -hmm. and i moved back in the corner um and there was this thing just probably right around there a little bit past you just standing in front of me and mm -hmm. it had this head that was shaped like a football at first i called them the sideways football heads i didn't know what to call them i never really asked for names i didn't i should ask for names but anyway and i worked with these guys for a long time football head and the eyes were on either end it had this sort of translucent little nose uh or two holes it was it was weird they were brown Mm -hmm. And they they were solid, but it had a translucent nostril area. I don't even know if it was a nostril. And then they had these sort of like, it was almost like octopus spindly legs okay. that it held itself kind up of, on. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I was freaking out because it's like all this adrenaline's running through your body and in your what body. What are you thinking? What's going through your mind? I mean, you see a creature that you've seen before remote yeah. viewing, but it's now, it's right in front of you. Yeah, I, so I didn't actually know what the heck it was. I didn't even relate it to that remote viewing session at that point because I was too freaked out in the moment. And so it, I'm freaking out. I'm like, rah, 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 like starting to like, you know, scream. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> and the thing projects into my mind. It says, "Quit being so emotional." It's like you're throwing bricks at me. Oh. Oh, I get, that's so, interesting. Right. So all of my emotions were like just directed towards it. this being. Yeah. yeah, it was hurting. I couldn't handle it. And yeah. so it started backing away from me and then it projected into my when I stopped, it mm. projected into my 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 mind, we are from the signal. So the signal was that project okay. that we were working. We called it the signal because they were coming through a signal mm -hmm. as well as they were coming through a signal that was moving from space. Very strange. Wow. And um, Arecibo radio telescope, mm -hmm. you know, that big one that was in the movie Contact, yeah. picked up yeah. the signal as it went into the, the jungle. Wow. Very strange. So anyway, wow. they said we are from the signal or this one individual. We are from the signal. We are here to help you and we want you to help us. Okay. Right. That and sounds, then that sounds nice. I mean, that, that, that sounds more benevolent. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah. So I didn't say anything. I didn't say anything. And it, it, what happened was another viewer and then another viewer had an experience with it. Okay. And so it kind so of verified what you Right. Because, had. I mean, I had it, but I'm like, what do I. It's I, always nice to have multiple people experience right. similar things. So at least, you know, like, okay. Right. Okay. So you saw this and that and you can yeah. overlap the data. Right. So then what happened was they started just full on communicating with me and they would show up, they would show up either like that physical or they would show up as a blue orb flying around Interesting. and then I'd get information. Mm -hmm. And so what they wanted from us, what they wanted from our remote viewing uh, company um, was they told me that there are some fireflies in danger and I was like, I don't freaking think so. Yeah. There's no fireflies well, in danger. They're everywhere. They're yeah, right? <laughs> so, um, on this earth, from what I'm understanding, they're everywhere, they're everywhere, right? Yeah. And so they showed me an image of these fireflies flashing in unison. Hmm. Like all of them, all at once, turning on, turning off, turning on, turning off. And so I, 
I thought, okay, so at least that's the direction. So I started researching, and there are only two locations in the world where there are these, what they call synchronous flashing fireflies. One is in the Amazon, and one is in Malaysia. The one in Malaysia, the habitat was getting destroyed. And so they wanted us to save these fireflies. Those particular Those fire specific wow. fireflies in Malaysia. They also told me that, you know, we didn't come here for humans. We have no interest in humans. We came here for them and other animals on the planet and species. You know That's how, beautiful. Right. I like that perspective because I feel like as humans, we think, oh, they're... Right. We're important. You know how? You yeah, know? I know. We're we so just have this ego. Right. <laughs> We're important, oh, and they the must be looking at us, us, and right? they're interested in us. Yeah. But that's really cool to hear that perspective. Right. That they they couldn't care less they about care us. Less. Like, We're here right. for the other beings. Yeah. Like you've got synchronistic fireflies. Exactly. That need your help. Right. That need our help. You know. Right. right. That's incredible. So they. I um, like that. That's. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Yeah. Different perspective. Totally different. <laughs> so. So what happened was I, I, I stepped in the way since uh -huh. I was the first viewer in. Mm -hmm. And at that point, they're like wondering how we can help them. And so the experience, so I've had other alien encounters and the ones that are interested in human know how to deal with humans. These mm -hmm. guys don't know how to deal with humans. Mm -hmm. They are, because how a normal alien deals with humans is like, oh, it's a wild animal animal you know tranquilize yeah. it kind of oh, thing. oh okay you know what i'm saying okay. like i see yeah it's like wipe their it's memory a beast. Like it's a must, beast yeah right interesting it's a crazy emotional beast right we do have a lot of These emotions guys, this they, right and that was hurting it <laughs> yeah because our emotions hurt them yeah because we're because they're ultra sensitive yeah emotions are things flying at something yeah so you have to be careful wow. right and these guys they were like they didn't know how to deal with humans because that wasn't their interest. But they knew that you'd be a helpful hand to them. Right, exactly. They knew that, which is, that's awesome. Right. I mean, they might not know how yeah. to deal with us, but... They didn't know how to deal at with At least he's able to... And so he telepathically told you, like... Yes, it was you're all You're hurting me, like, like, chill. Right, chill out, a chill out. Yeah. Chill out buddy. <laughs> Don't freak out. Like, I'm not going to eat you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or, I mean, that's, that's a nice warning, too. I don't too, think that thing could eat me. You I'm not going to tickle I mean, your toes. Yeah. Like, I don't know. Little tendrils. <laughs> don't worry, my tickle tendrils are, are safe. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I don't want to do anything with you, but I need your help. Right. And so what ended up happening then? So you found out about these fireflies. They right. came to you for assistance. What? So we started to remote view the best way to save the fireflies in their habitat. Mm -hmm. And all we kept getting was a documentary. A documentary. To bring awareness? Film. Yeah, to bring awareness. Okay. Because they were building a dam, and it's the Sungai Selangor River. And where the... Um, river hits the ocean the tide goes in and the river goes mm -hmm. out and it creates this like salinity in the water that is perfect for their habitat and it the dam is disrupting it as well as all of the uh the pesticides and chemicals in the farms right around that general area mm -hmm. so they're getting destroyed by both sides but the dam is the real clincher that one is going to stop the flow reduce the flow and they only live on these specific trees called the uh, barambang tree, I believe, mm -hmm. that, that needs a, a certain type of salinity um, in order to grow. And that was getting wiped out, totally wiped out. So, you know, we talked to people we knew in Hollywood, but nobody was interested. You know, they don't care about... They don't care about fireflies. They don't care about fireflies. They have other priorities. <laughs> yeah, so... Other agendas. I mean, they probably would have been interested in the story of, you know how they came they, the contact part but mm -hmm. that would have just turned it into some like third rate reality tv show that would have been no i didn't want to do that <laughs> who are these crazy people yeah we would just be portrayed as crazy people talking yeah. to aliens that need to save the fire and have the, <laughs> the tinfoil hat right that, exactly that, that's us <laughs> yeah just like granola like <laughs> sticks in our hair yeah and, like, <laughs> save the fireflies the aliens are telling save the fireflies <laughs> yeah not good. <laughs> no. So no. better not go that route. Right, they want exactly. to help out anyway. So right, right, right. <laughs> I swear, man, I'm totally legit. I worked for um, FBI. I've worked for government. You know, with remote viewing. So mm -hmm. you know, we aren't the granola type. That's not bad. I mean, that's good. But it's like we came from the sort of like business world of remote viewing mm -hmm. after it was declassified in the think tank and stuff, as opposed to. Um, any other direction. So we were working um, as a team, a paid team of remote viewers for years, um, 
working with government agencies, um, counter-terror, um, chasing terrorists, that kind of stuff, as well as corporations like computer companies and you name it, household wow. name companies. Um, I mean, who wouldn't benefit from remote viewing? Right. Are there, are there any limits to it? No, no limits. I okay, mean, you then... can see that. I mean, just about yeah. anything can be remote viewed and information on anything can be gotten. Choose which direction you're going to go based on remote yep. viewing anything. So okay, so back to the fireflies. So we we couldn't get it together on the documentary side, and it was really specific. So you know, I thought it was done deal. I thought it, it was like uh, we can't help them, you know. And that's probably the original reason why they didn't go to Cuba. They probably had a different idea of how they were going to attack the problem, and it, you know, in the off chance that we could. Um, help you know maybe we could help anyway so at that moment at that time so i was creating something called the environmental healing protocol and it was also a species healing protocol and it's like remote healing that you learn um, except it's more extensive and you can heal environments and we tested it on a number of locations beforehand and what happens when you (coughs) excuse me use this is that this healing protocol brings things to bear uh, either through slight like miraculous happenings or it brings scientists in or it galvanizes public response. So something happens, energy awareness and energy towards it. Right, so we would do this, you know, I would do this. I don't know if any of the other viewers were doing this, but I would do this on a frequent basis, remote viewing and remote healing the location because I thought it was, I thought we had, it just, you know, we failed them, you know, mm-hmm. ultimately. And that was like the last ditch effort on my part. And eventually, over the years, we saw this slow um, evolution where more stringent um, laws were put on the uh, farmers to not pollute. Um, the, the dam, to keep the dam open mm-hmm. because they, because there was a big focus now, public on those uh, fireflies and now what they're doing from what i understand is they're going to decommission that dam so it did become successful you, yep. you succeeded in the... right right wow. but not in the way that we thought it would yeah yeah but it still brought the ways that you did go about it brought awareness right. and the fireflies are not extinct right as of 2018 yeah, and they're, doing they're well. still here they're, they're, they're doing... coming back really yeah wow and wow. the reason why these That's guys awesome. were interested in them is that mm-hmm. Well, they're genetically related to them. Oh. The, so the fi- those fireflies could an extended be extended family, an evolutionary. <laughs> you know, it could be that these. So I call them the firefly guys. Mm-hmm. You know, the, those aliens. They could be um, the future of fireflies in a sense. So mm-hmm. they could be wow. like fire. The fireflies could be the cavemen of the fireflies. They could be. You know I, mean, I mean, who who knows? Yeah, you know, the primitive cavemen. Yeah, you know? they're just starting <laughs> off and right. And they eventually Maybe turn into of, that. Take a couple of genetics from them. Right. And here yeah. you go. You got your being in the right. in your room. Right. I know. <laughs> right crazy. In front of you. Wow. Super that's crazy. that's really cool. Thank you for sharing yeah. that. That's awesome. Um, could you tell me? Uh, so you cover a lot of range of topics, and you go very deep in it. Is there anything you'd like to talk about on our show that you don't typically talk about? Hmm. What don't I typically talk about? that you have an interest in that maybe relates to remote viewing or yeah man it's i'm so transparent i talk about everything (laughs) um yeah hard for me to think do you have maybe want to do you have a crazy experience maybe at your time at the ranch here that you'd like to oh you mean like um like last night (laughs) yeah you could go into that yeah yeah that was weird last night we had a um a situation where um, I'm staying out in a trailer here while I teach the class Mm -hmm. and back of the woods there and um, a huge light came on from the outside it was like two in the morning and you know I opened my eyes and our trailer inside was lit up by something from the outside Mm -hmm. and and then I was gonna go you know I was trying to figure out what it was and then it shut off and so I went outside and didn't see or hear anything. And then after that, I had just really super bizarre nightmares all night. And then I wake up and 
talk to other people. So other people had missing time out here around the same time or just before. And they also um, had really screwed up dreams where they were trying to escape from something. And then James had a uh, situation where he was um, seeing this being that was like a star. He was he was saying him. at breakfast that it was like a a starfish like right. being. Right. And so it we didn't yeah. have much of a the expression wasn't right. It was very very unique. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I can't. I wasn't there, so I can't really explain it. Right. But it'd be interesting to see if all of this correlated within the same time frame. It was all you in know? the same time. Frame. Really? Yeah. See, that's that's something. Yeah. Wow. It was all in the same time frame and. Um, is that normal for you? Do you normally get no, these kind of weird experiences? Not at all. Not at okay. all. Well, I mean, I've had abduction experiences, but this mm. was, this felt like um, something came in and was generating negative experiences within me and other people mm. here. And since this is a, a Stargate portal in this area and up the mountain, um, I'm pretty sure it came from that. What does that mean as a Stargate portal? Um, could you go could this you go this that? oh yeah this yeah this place especially on the mountain you have this magnetic anomaly or this whole region is a magnetic anomaly mm -hmm. you've got um, a complete dropout of magnetism next to intense magnetism and where you see okay. those on on geomagnetic maps on the earth uh, you can usually find a lot of strange happenings like mm -hmm. reports of strange phenomena occurring <laughs> And um, what happens in these locations? So we re remote viewed this. If, if, for instance, think of a stacked multiverse. You know, it's it's postulated that we live in a stacked multiverse, mm -hmm. and we've seen that we do with remote viewing, and that means we are layered in between other universes. Mm -hmm. So when you have a magnetic anomaly of this degree, it 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 kind of warps out the multiverse so that you have points of each multiverse touching it stretches okay. and pulls so it's a them. portal yeah and so it creates doorways it, yeah. to other worlds and who knows what the heck's coming through here i mean you have yeah. positive and negative things i mean with the good there's always going to be the polar right it's opposite. like a pendulum yeah, yeah. It goes always goes back and forth mm -hmm. but the 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 big thing about this place and the most i don't know ubiquitous encounter that people have is with the uh, lion king mm -hmm. and the merkaba type situation and that's what's flying over here and so those things when we remote view them are protecting the gate they're like the keepers of this gate here not allowing or most of the time most mostly protecting the, mostly the protecting, area from but, whatever negative right or lower vibration that could come through right and so Interesting. you get this occurrence here uh sometimes where you do get negative things focused on it mm -hmm. Because it is, it's, this is a sought after place by other beings. So how does this place compare to like Mount Shasta? I know Mount yeah. Shasta, it, you, it was said that it was used to be a very high vibrational location and people would flock there. Right. And um, could you maybe go into that? How, how is Mount Shasta now? Have you remote viewed it recently? Like Mount Shasta is not what it used to be. Mm. It's, um, we've seen a lot of really bizarre things there. Because I do a lot of work around there on the mysteries that have occurred and are occurring mm -hmm. and and no matter what we look at it usually turns to a darker thing that's living around the area this is in recent viewing yeah, yeah yeah recent mm -hmm. viewing probably best not to talk about these things but yeah. um we don't have to go into detail yeah i was just, just curious because it used to be from my understanding a very high vibrational location right it's not i've just heard as of recently that it's not what it, it's not what right. it used to be anymore it's not it's definitely mm. not i mean it's pretty empty. It's vacant in a sense. I think it used to be that there could have been, there is a gate portal there, but I don't, I have no idea because you find the same magnetic anomaly there. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the phenomena can be attributed to that and it still can be used, but I, I think something else has taken it over is mm -hmm. my guess. And mostly now you just have a lot of negative beings and entities mm -hmm. around there. There might be some positive pockets areas so. here mm -hmm. and there and I, some people may find them but i think what's happening there is a lot of people are are going off the paths mm -hmm. you know and sort of mm -hmm. like oh it's such a spiritual place but no uh, yeah so energetic much. when you check it out it's beautiful mm -hmm. i love that mountain it's so yeah. beautiful 
but it's just, you know, well, okay, so go to the northern part of Mount Shasta, it turns into this, um, like a, uh, a high desert. And that's where Pluto's cave is. But what you find over in that area is our, our megalithic structures. So ancient structures. Really? Oh, yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, there are wow. hills in that area where there are these massive rocks. I mean, stuff that we can't move. And going up like a, I don't know, an ang a steep angle, mm -hmm. like spiraling up hills. We can't there reproduce that right now. There are lines of rock walls, massive boulders everywhere in that area. And you, it, it, they were constructed. Mm -hmm. The natives of the area say they were here when we got here. We don't know. Wow. You know, so we were... Well, there's a history. There's a deep history to right. it for sure. So this is something I, I have not really talked about much at all. Um, I, I, don't, I don't think I've mentioned this. Anyway, so we were remote viewing these structures because the megalithic structures fascinate me. You mm -hmm. find them in the East Bay of San Francisco as well. Actually, all the way down to Morro Bay in California, you can find these megalithic structures. When we view them, what they were specifically for, I mean, our data specifically details out transferring energy. So they mm -hmm. were building these, these walls using um, like a granite with uh, a quartz crystal in there. Mm -hmm. And there's a, a charge that runs through the rocks. And you can actually stick a DC voltmeter in them now and pick up a charge. Mm -hmm. wow. So they were running them through and, and pooling the energy in certain places in order to, to utilize it. They're making like an with. electrical grid. Right, exactly. <laughs> so, and they were specifically using Mount Shasta to, to run that the energy hub. off yeah. because wow. yeah wow yeah and this is ancient technology this is before native americans crossed the land bridge 12,000 years ago mm -hmm. to come over here because they said it was here before them they also have did they know did they have any kind of understanding of what that it was some sort of electrical no grid? Uh, no they wow. i don't believe they have an understanding of that we saw that in our remote viewing data some people have postulated that like there was a guy named Jonathan Burke uh, who wrote a book called Seeds of Plenty mm -hmm. and he guessed that a lot of megalithic sites were built to charge seeds. Um, and okay. little, you can, you can take seeds, you get a, you know, um, a handful, of, handful of seeds, whatever. whatever. Yeah, and then, mm -hmm. and then charge them in one of these megalithic sites and then plant them and they grow better than a control group. You know, really? That's not been That's charged. interesting. Yeah. Huh. Um, so, you know, at least there's that. There's the speculation that it was ancient technology and that's what we get it's ancient mm. technology and that's there's a lot of that around there in that general area the natives believe that the native americans believe that the um okay there was a woman named lucy thompson mm. 19 early 1900s she wrote a book she was a uh, a native i can't remember which native tribe she was from but from the shasta area okay she learned how to read and write and she wrote a book about her people and this book was for her people so they'd remember and she wrote it in english she there's some interesting chapters in that book where she talks about when they crossed the land bridge twelve thousand years ago these are stories that are passed down to her she said that when they got here there were two at least two different races of people here living mm. here there was a race of giants she said very huge people that would eat them and they would also they all they also had, an, there was another race they called the Wagas, W-A-G-A-S. And other tribes call them the Woge. Other tribes have the legends of these guys too, as well as the giants. And they were here, they were small white skinned people. Mm -hmm. And this is 12,000 years ago, right? And they became close with this other tribe, they called them the Wagas. And they would show them how to live off the land and stuff. And at a certain point, she said that they, um, they claimed they had to go north because they were going to go home. They're going okay. home. They're leaving the planet. Mm -hmm. They're leaving. Right. They're not going to just move north. Right. 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 And they, but they had okay. said, we will set up stone monuments for you to wait for us at. Right. Okay. So it could be. So a lot of the native tribes thinks that the Wagas made mm -hmm. them. Um, you also find up there, actually, we found around Mount Shasta a, um, a Stargate door portal into the into a rock wall interesting okay. uh -huh. 
were you um, able to you can feel it you can okay. you can absolutely feel well, it our our so our friend was a friend of ours a guy that i researched with his name's dustin neff he's written a book um mount shasta mysteries and he was researching a story where a little boy had disappeared and he was looking for you know the story was the boy was taken into a cave so he was looking for a cave in mm. this area and then he found this strange you know what a false door looks like it's basically this uh the egyptians used them they used them or native cultures use them as this um representative of a pathway to another world for the dead or or to okay. to transfer yourself spiritually to another realm and there's a place in uh, peru um, called aramu muru which is a massive rock wall and there's a a door carved into it. The door doesn't go anywhere, mm -hmm. right? But it, it's just it has got, a shape. It's the shape of a door. Like, and people mm -hmm. will go up and put their heads against it, and they say they'll see into another world. And the natives, the villagers around Aramumuru, have said that people have disappeared into just, it. Right. Into it. So wow. we, so my friend found a feature like that around Mount Shasta that looks similar to Aramumuru. So. When he was taking photographs of it, there were these wisps of, of white and orbs showing up in front of this feature. So he asked us if we would remote view that. See what's going on, maybe. Yeah, like, you know, is it just, just a rock curiosity. wall, mm -hmm. cliff, or is it something? We got that it was a portal to another world, you know, really fascinating. And again, it's like the one of those things that the native uh, peoples believe that the Wagas probably built that and, and, and that's they think that they probably transferred to another world through these rock portals these rock doorways wow. yeah right that's that we pretty found cool. yeah nobody knows about this doorway wow. nobody knows where it is what a real. cool thing thank you for sharing that yeah that, that's 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 something yeah wow yeah definitely gonna have to do some more research on that i've never yeah i've never heard of this yeah. type of door there Right. You know, I've heard no. of the one in Peru. But. Right. Nobody knows of it, really. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, I think I'm going to wrap it up for okay. today. Um, thank you so much, John, for being on our show here. I really think this was an incredible conversation. Um, I really enjoyed your workshop this past weekend here at Yosemite, too. Awesome. That was, yeah, like I said, good. I went into it blind, and everything that I, every experiment that we had tried, I got something well. from it. Yeah. yeah, it was really, I was really impressed and I definitely want to continue with this. Um, just a cool skill to have. And it's fun. Yeah. It's really fun. Yeah. So I really appreciate you coming out here to the ranch and coming on to the show and I hope to have you back sometime. I will. It'll be you wonderful. Will. Yeah. Thank you so much. And then I could definitely put your uh, information link down below here. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so Get people can there. check it out. Look into John Vivanka's remote viewing workshop. And yeah, so thank you so much. You're and welcome. we'll talk to you later. All right. Bye, guys. Have a wonderful day and uh, catch the next episode. Bye.